I'll be fine. We usually do. <laughs> We're not the right questions. We could, you know, I could talk about Iraq forever, actually. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Joanne Michael Show. Today, I'm really honored to have with me Lorna Tykosta, who was in Iraq three times over the last two years of the war and also visited Iraq once before the war started. She's a photo photojournalist who's an editor, writer with Chronogram magazine, and she was good enough to share some of her uh, very insightful ideas about what's really happening over there. A lot of us are uh, thoroughly confused at this point, and uh, so are our leaders, in my estimation. Anyway, um, welcome to the Joanne Michael Show. Lauren, and thank you very much for coming and for bringing your photos as well. Thanks, thanks for having me, Joanne. They're really striking. Uh, after I heard your talk in uh, Poughkeepsie, mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, when I walked out of there, you know, my boyfriend said to me, she has more guts than I'll ever have to go over there. What made you take a trip like that initially, the first time? You know, um, I've raised uh, two children through college now at this point, and the dream was always that when they were in, in out of, under my wing, that I would do travel writing. I didn't know um, our country would be involved in a war. So initially I wanted to go to Afghanistan, and, mm -hmm. um, I had made arrangements and that trip fell through. When the war in Iraq was about to break out, I thought um, it was very important that if we were going to war with another country, that we at least know who we were going to be fighting. And I really felt that most people in America did not know what an Iraqi person looked like or um, knew anything about the culture. Certainly I didn't. So I thought uh, let me, I would like to go there and uh, take as many pictures as possible to bring home the face of the Iraqi people so that we can see just who we will be um, fighting. Weren't you frightened uh, to go over there with the violence that was being publicized even at that time before the war? It wasn't exactly considered a safe place. And then as you went back three times, it got even more and more dangerous and the war became full blown. So weren't you afraid? Um, to tell you the truth, the first time there was some trepidation, you know, but. Uh, it was a, it was peacetime. There was there wasn't there was a chance of um, Iraq being bombed maybe while I was in the country, but we were, I was under the understanding that the UN would give 48 hours um, notice. I mean that's something that's normal protocol uh, for us to be able to leave the country. People who you know foreigners who are in the country. Mm -hmm. So and once I got there, I mean it was incredibly safe atmosphere. Certainly because Saddam uh, was watching everything that everybody did and his spies, anything, um, anyone would have touched me or the wrong person actually t would t talk to me, you know, would, if they were to talk to me, would, would have maybe even been taken away, killed, tortured perhaps. You know, so to talk to a Westerner was, you know, against his, you know, against his wishes. So how did you get these photos then that you have here? Like, <laughs> uh, you know, because uh, many of them are of, pe of the Iraqi people. And how did you, if people were so frightened about having any contact with a Westerner, was it, were these all done on your later um, trips? Or? Some of these were done uh, recently. Some of these, like for instance this photo, um, this was done before the war. Oh, uh, I see. So this, so he could have yeah. gotten into a lot of trouble for being um, we were told, you know, if we kept it to portraits of people and we didn't take photographs of buildings or, you know, uh, water treatment facilities mm -hmm. or communication buildings, this type of thing, um, that we would be okay. I actually had a government minder with me this day. I kind of ditched him. <laughs> really? Um, this is in the bird market in Baghdad. And, so you had uh, a guide with you very often? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me show um, everybody these others. They're really quite striking. And I like the black and white. It's sort of very... Well, you know, the whole point was to bring home the face of the Iraqi people and uh, so that people here in this country could see what they look like. The gentleman in the wheelchair I actually saw on my last trip there when I was there for the election. I found him. Really? Yeah. This was taken down in Basra. The women. It's a nice photo also. You know, when I look at this photo and I give my presentations, I tell people to look at the construction here of the walls. There were reports of during the beginning of the war um, when we first tilt the picture down, like there you go. When we first um, entered in the south, um, journalists would go into homes and find you know bodies of men and children and women 
laying in you know heaps of blood because the you know the bullets go right through the walls so we oh. were shooting we were given the, the our soldiers were given the coalition forces were given the order to shoot at will and um you know it's a horrible thing to send people to war and they did shoot at will and they sh shot at buildings and innocent so people were killed <coughs> um, this is in the Sunni Triangle in a village called uh, Abu Hishma. It's a Sunni uh, farming village. This is a um, young boy kissing his grandfather. I had gone there um, to investigate the um, killing of a couple of men, supposedly by coalition forces. And it didn't turn out to be conclusive. It looked like maybe someone from the village was a rival. Wasn't, so rival sometimes, it's no, sometimes it's not the Americans. Sometimes it's not the Americans. A lot of criminals. Um, mm. This is also in Basra. This was taken actually before the war. Um, just children, you know, they love to have their pictures taken. They were following me around the village as we were walking. And um, you can see their heads are a little bit larger than their bodies. These children are probably much um, younger than they appear to be. There was uh, some malnutrition mm -hmm. in, the, in the south. Where did you stay when you were down out there? Um, there was a hotel in Basra. When I was in Baghdad, mm -hmm. I stayed in a hotel uh, across the street from the Palestine and Sheridan hotels, which have gotten some you know, play in the media. This is also, this was in the south um, before the war. I call him my boyfriend. Um, <laughs> I, just think he's, I just think that this is an incredibly gorgeous person. Um, many of the Iraqi people certainly have uh, stolen my heart. Do they speak English for any of them? Some do. This gentleman did. Um, some, you know, they, uh, you know, they at least attempt to speak English. They're always trying to communicate. They love to have their picture taken. Did you have to wear a burqa um, and and sort of uh, dress? This is something that that has been a concern. You know, dress as a, a you know a Middle Eastern woman and a, you know with a head piece no. and all that. So um, you were able to move freely. Well, for the first three visits, certainly I did not have to. This summer, I was uh, in Baghdad, and I went to Sadr City for Friday mm -hmm. prayers. Um, it's, you know, Christians have their religious uh, day as Sunday, Jews have their day as Saturday, Muslims have, uh, as Friday is their day of prayer. So to go there, yes, I had to put on a hijab. They don't have burqas really there. Mm -hmm. they, I wore a hijab and a, and a, and a black abaya, which is a long-sleeved, floor-length black gown. Um, mm -hmm. It was about 130 degrees. Really? Yeah, it's oh. very, uh, very interesting to see the way the biology of the body works <laughs> to, to cool you off. So, and this last trip, especially every time I left the hotel, I wore um, my hijab and the abaya. Why on the last time? This was it was incredibly dangerous. It was, so it uh, was. Yeah. Well, I, normally when I go to Iraq, I stay in unprotected hotels uh, with no guards, no cement blast, 16 foot blast walls. This last time I chose to stay in a hotel that was a part of a complex of several hotels and shops. And, um, you know, so you're with the media. And as you go through the checkpoints going in and out, people are watching. You have to, ex you know, you just have to um, assume that people are watching. And, um, and Westerners were very much being targeted. And it Was there a time where, you, a moment or where you thought you were in grave danger? Or you had Many times. <laughs> okay, when, what was that like? Um, well, there was one time I was, uh, I didn't have my interpreter with me, I had my driver, and we were going to interview, I was uh, attempting to find the home of the Iraqi Minister of Immigration and Displacement, a 43-year-old woman, wonderful, incredible woman that I had met in Amman. And we were at a checkpoint, we were actually at the wrong checkpoint. And um, as we pulled up, first we, we were in, you know, inspected by uh, several Iraqi special forces guys. And then we pulled up 30 more feet and we were, the Iraqi soldiers came to inspect the car. And as we were showing them our press credentials, someone pulled up in a car behind us maybe 50 feet and started firing in our direction. You know, Kalashnikov for fire. And the soldiers immediately stopped talking to us and kind of went behind our car, um, formed a semicircle, and started shooting. And, you know, I, I don't remember feeling any fear really. It was just kind of like, wow, you know, um, I think, I, I, I guess they're shooting at us. And, uh, and I thought, okay, well, I guess I should get to the, seat, the, the floor of the car. Mm -hmm. And I went down on the, to the floor of the car, and my driver started to get out of the vehicle. And I pulled him back because I thought at least if we were in the car, he couldn't, you know, the steering wheel was in his way. He couldn't go down. And, um, and then the firing, you know, stopped. And he did finally get out. And, uh, you know, the soldiers came back over and we kind of laughed about it. 
It was very interesting. But at that m moment when I went to the floor, I thought to myself, this is how innocent people get killed at the checkpoints. It was just, it was so totally clear to me. You know, because after the <clears throat> soldiers, the Iraqi soldiers took this defensive position, then um, within a few minutes, maybe, not, maybe not even a few, 30 seconds, uh, you know, some Humvees, American soldiers, Humvees, and, and uh, you know, armored personnel vehicles kind of shot out and chased the people down the road. and. Five helicopters filled. We were very close to the green zone. Really? Five helicopters mm -hmm. came into the air, you know. So as we were driving away from this scene, you know, we they they directed us, and it was very. It was the day before election day, so there, was, there were no cars on the road in this particular vicinity. So we drove with our passes out the window, and then for the helicopters, I actually like lifted my hand up, you know, hoping because they were tilting to see what we were doing and who we were, lifting my pass up. And when we got to a certain point, my driver said, "Okay, you know." Um, Maybe it's time to go back to the hotel now. He doesn't speak really much English. And I was like, yes, let, let's go back. Because, you know, it was just like, it was too much at that point. So we got off the ramp. And as we got on the main highway where there was some cars, he said, and this guy does not really speak English, but he said in perfect English, this sent a full sentence, so now you maybe have great story to write. <laughs> and we just, you yeah. know, the tension, it was such yeah. a great tension. Yeah. Really. We just laughed till we both cried. You know, we were laughing and laughing. So there were moments. And you also mentioned the airport road from yeah. uh, the airport to Baghdad. Yeah. You said it's a very, very scary it's a horrifying. route. It's a horrifying road. So and every time you went into the country, you had to go on that road, yeah. right? Well, um, no, time just left. this last time. I would never have gone on that road before. Every time that I've traveled back and forth to Baghdad from, from Amman, Jordan, before this, I've driven in. It's a 12-hour, 100-mile-an-hour in a, in a huge SUV. Uh, hurdle across the desert, and I loved the trip, but you know it had become it, it, it's gotten to the point or it was at the point where they would check they you know you you hand your passport over, and there's a spy system, and you know someone makes the phone call ahead American passports coming through this is the license plates on the vehicle and within two hours you know there's a chance that you could be pulled over, and uh, kidnapped or whatever you know rolled for your money or equipment did you or fear being taken hostage i mean that italian woman was taken hostage and there've been certain people it's very random i mean it's not really something that i mean there were other people who were afraid for me you know mm -hmm. certainly there was the the, the bureau chief of the la times was like you you don't have an armored car to drive around and you don't have a bodyguard cuz i drive around in a in an iraqi car with iraqi you know people and i try to look iraqi so that we just really blend in the journalists, that's one of the big problems, I think, with the media. I mean, they, 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 are, they have to be removed, I guess, in their minds mm -hmm. to protect themselves. The Italian journalist, I mean, she was wearing Western women clothing. She was standing on a street corner in broad daylight outside of Baghdad University. The word on the street from people I know in Baghdad are, are that her, both her driver and her interpreter, they were not kidnapped. Normally, they're kidnapped or killed. You know, Iraqis working with Westerners. They were not taken. So the word on the street is that, you know, maybe they set her up. <laughs> Oh, but she was making a statement, you know, she didn't, she, some people feel very strongly that they don't want to conform, you know, to this religiousness or whatever. Me, in order, I'll, I'll wear, you know, a garbage bag to get the job done. <laughs> and, and then, you know, for her to say that our special forces tried to take her out, I thought that was a little over the top as well. It is the most dangerous road. You know, Alyssa Rubin from the LA Times had written an article after, after she would, the, the Italian woman was released, saying that, you know, and I, it mirrored my own feelings, being on that road, just being on it. And you see, they, you know, all the trees have been chopped down in the island, and there are checkpoints. And uh, if someone's driving erratically, you get nervous because you think that they could be a terrorist. And you, you almost want someone to take the car out if, 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 if mm -hmm. they are a terrorist, you know, or whatever. Um, you know, you get this sick, queasy feeling. You know, when Alyssa wrote that, I was like, yeah, I remember getting that, like, just get me to the airport, you know, just get me to the airport, because it is like seven miles of, of terror. So here they were, and I, they were driving at night. Mm -hmm. You know, they, she, she was released, they picked her up, they're driving at night, it just happened, I mean, it was, you know, I don't think it was purposely done, but it happened to be a ter horrible coincidence that, um, you know, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador was moving around on that road, so the, the precautions maybe were extra, super high. Um, and they saw this car coming and, and, uh, and you know, shot at it. It's, it's, um, I'm not condoning the violence that happens. I mean, mm -hmm. I've heard many horrible stories of uh, innocent civilians 
you know, a family when while I was in uh, in Iraq this time was uh, driving on a road, um, and the there was a journalist, a photojournalist, out with this uh, patrol, these mm -hmm. Iraqis patrolling, uh, American troops patrolling, and as um, you know, it was dark, and they heard a car coming, and there was an order given that the tell, make the car halt, and. Um, I guess somebody did a warning shot, and then the other soldiers just started shooting because it's this. Was you, that you the Hassan have, family? There was <coughs> a, a fo there was a story six, about that. Six the children, six children. The, yeah. right? You know, and were, we all kind of read that with this understanding. It's one thing to be outside the country and never have experienced a war zone and make your judgment about something like that. It's quite another. You know, to think that we send young children from this country, 17, 18, 19 year olds, over there and expect them to be walking around. No matter how trained you are, you're afraid. You're carrying a gun. And a car is coming at you, and you don't know. You don't know what it is. And you open up. Those guys will never be the same who shot at that car. They're sick now. They're going to need medical, you know, uh, mental health attention. And, you know, um, and I'm sure they, got, they probably got physically ill as well. You know, um, when they realized they had killed innocent children. children. You know, the parents, and right in front of the children. I mean, you know, those types of things to happen, we have to start, I think, then we have to take the discussion, if we're upset about this, how do we prevent that from happening? Not, not so much do we punish these people. I mean, that's a part of the question, but the greater part of the question in my mind is how do we create a situation where we don't have to put these people in that position to have to do something like this? What no, are the alternatives available to us, you know, so that we don't have to send people into these, into these situations? Well, you've certainly seen a lot. One of the things uh, that I, I'm curious about is how you feel women will fare in this new regime, which tends to be even more traditionalist uh, Islamic than even Saddam Hussein's uh, regime. Uh, like you said, the the minister of um, immigration is a 43 year old woman. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe that's unusual. And they this new regime wants to do away with. They want to have women in more traditional uh, roles, keep them out of things. How do you, what was your feeling about what that what's going to be? Because they, this uh, piece in the New York Times was an interesting one. You said some of it. Didn't I, think true. It, I think this person who wrote this editorial needs to take a, a visit to the country. I mean, you know, it is certainly a concern in all um, in all of the uh, Muslim countries that the even amongst uh, Muslim people themselves that the fundamentalists take control. You know, in Morocco, for instance, this is a great a great concern. Mm -hmm. No one wants the fundamentalists to take control. Um, they uh, women enjoy if, ha, have enjoyed freedom, certain levels of freedoms in Iraq, and I don't think they're going to be too willing to be giving them up. Um, I think what I, see, my, what I see happening is that you have uh, this last this election um, certainly laid out some type of bedrock where you have the different groups are now um, discussing. You know, you have the Kurds. They're, they're not going to, no, one, no Kurdish women are going to be covering themselves anytime soon, you know, or, or giving up their freedoms that they've earned. Just explain that. I think a lot of Americans are very, very um, unclear about this. I, I am pretty, I read over and over, the Kurds tend to be more egalitarian with the women. They tend Very to be interested in, demo in, in That's democracy. That's one yeah. group. Mm -hmm. of, there are women's the groups people. that have been in existence up in Kurdistan for many years now, uh, fighting for women's rights, you know. Um, uh, even amongst the Shia, there are many Shia people, m women, who now have the Shia, had jobs. Shia, there's the Sunnis. Okay, we have Sunni, we right. have Shia. We have the Kurds, there's Turkomen, uh, there are Christians, there are Syrians. You know, but the major groups, I would say, are, are the, the Shia. The, are the, right? the Shia mm -hmm. And then you have the Sunni and the Kurds. And, and right. those this is three the, groups. Yes. Okay. But the majority, uh, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is the Shia. Are, isn't that the majority? Yes, but you, also, but you also have to understand Shia marries Sunni, mm -hmm. Sunni marries Shia. Um, they had a little, you know, like they, they, um, they live on the same streets together. It's not this great big divide that we have been fed. I see. Um, there's definitely not this huge schism. Um, what, I, what I would say now, say for instance, with the insurgency in Iraq, what we're, what we're seeing is these are former Saddam Ba'athists, maybe Saddam lovers, Ba'athists, who are um, holding on to the power that they, that they don't want to believe that they, <laughs> they don't have anymore. Um, I think, I mean, I've seen discussions between Sunni and Shia people um, 
where you know they they might be a little leery, but you know their neighbors and their relatives. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not this big divide, and I see it more as you know there's the fundamentalists you know are having a voice now certainly you know Muqtadar al-Sadr is another fundamentalist. I mean it's not very pleasant some of the for women some of the things you know for us as Western mm -hmm. women and Western men um, what Muqtadar is saying, but. Um, I just see there's going to be, I, I feel, and maybe I'm being too optimistic here, that there'll be a, a healthy balance uh, going on. The Constitution of the, the interim Constitution itself says that there must be a, uh, I believe it's 20 or 25 percent of the Parliament must be women. Oh, and right. It has to be a representative. Uh, women have to be represented. And if you look at our Senate, I mean, I don't know what the figure are. I don't. I haven't I checked it since nine, the election. Nine percent or eleven percent, somewhere between well, nine and eleven. Before this last election, we have we had twelve women senators. Right. I mean, so I mean you know. Well, see, and this 11%. is the problem. The, the problem with this editorial, I find, and the problem that I see now with the people conversing about the elections. Um, our, in our first election, we had ten percent of the population voted. They were what, all men, white. Anglo-Saxon Protestants, wealthy landowners. Which was 1870, was it? Or In the, uh, you know, after, whenever, I'm not sure the date of the first. No, 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 no. It was after the Constitution. You know, we had our Constitution. It was in the seven. I would say it's in the 1780s. Uh, something seven, like that. 1787. Yeah. And, seven. Um, you know, and then the rest of the men in our country didn't get the vote until 1870. That's what I'm thinking, right. And, and then women. 1920, right? So... You know, so when and you, we, and, and we, do we have a perfect democracy? You know, we're asking this country to snap to it. I mean, I think this is a little bit unfair. We're saying you just had your election, you have 15 minutes by the schedule, you have to have, all of you have to come to agreement. I mean, I don't know how long our Constitutional Congress took. In fact, I was thinking about going and asking one of my old college professors to give me a tutorial about this. You know, democracy is something that you participate in. It's a work in progress. Um, it, it's something that even now in this country we're still working at. To look at the Iraqi situation and say, we want you to have your democracy up and running. It's got to have freedom for women. It's got to have this. It's got to have that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, like, it's like, you know, when we send the kids off to college and put all that pressure on them that they have to be something when they grow up and they have to know that at 20. I mean, mm -hmm. we won't know uh, the, the uh, result, really, of what... Of what Root of democracy will take place in Iraq for years. I mean, yeah. we're just watching a, some country birthing itself. You know, they're fighting, they're yelling. This is what they're supposed to be doing. Plus, you're making me think that the fundamentalism that they're dealing with, we are dealing with a rebirth of it in our own country. So intense yeah, you have that the the Supreme Court is having to to rule over these things. It's uh, it's fairly frightening that a, a minority of fundamentalists in this country has as much power as they do over life and death yes. decisions. And see, they, this know. is an excellent point you're making. I mean, I, I also believe the fundamentalists in these other places mm -hmm. play, they're small in number, but they have big voices. Well, that's like here. Yes. More so than ever you know? before. I mean, um, I think we have to look, like I brought up Morocco before, I think we have to look to the example of Morocco. You know, the, the old king died, his son took his place, some, like 1999 or 2000, and he made, uh, he made huge changes to the family law of Morocco because it was very um, against women against women's rights. Women couldn't get divorced, only men could divorce, could choose to be divorced. Um, women um, didn't get the property. They really, uh, they had no, no rights whatsoever. And, and he, this young guy, marries uh, someone who's not a member of the royal family. She's a modern woman. She has it. She's a commoner. She has. She shows her. He presents mm -hmm. her. This is not something that's done in the Muslim world to, the, to his public. And then, um, you know, he installs these new laws that make the mm -hmm. uh, equity between men and women. What happens? 40,000 people come, uh, you know, and say thank you very much. They march in the streets. Four days later, 400,000 fundamentalists are like, we, you know, you're following the Western model. What are you doing? So what, he could have dropped the ball there and, and, and forgot about these new laws. What he did was he went back. He got some women, from, some feminists, including from, from the, uh, you know, Muslim women mm -hmm. feminists. Right. He took some uh, clerics. He threw the Koran at them. He said, here, sit in this room, figure it out. Come up with a set of rules, because the Koran is, is a fair document, you know, it's a fair book. Come up with some rules that are equally beneficial, that, you know, that, so that women can have equal rights. And they did. You know, they included, it's not mm -hmm. like we're the Westerners, we have to put our brand of, of uh, democracy 
you know, because you can't have democracy unless you have equality between men and women. Um, we're going to put our form of, of uh, democracy, shove it down your throat. No, they have, they have their belief system. They're Muslim. They have a book. It's called the Quran. So according to the Quran, figure out your democracy. You know, and that's when we, where yeah, that's you know, the moderates point. come in and not, mm -hmm. the, not the fundamentalists. No, it's interesting. And also, they, my son spent uh, some time in Qatar. Mm -hmm. And I asked him about the government there. And it's, a, again, a family thing where the, the son, you know, took over. You know, they have these, like, they're almost like sheiks that run these. Mm -hmm. um, it's tribal. The tribal thing. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of these countries were artificially created originally by the Western world anyway. Yeah. So we have to remember that. But every time I was talking to my son about it, and I realized, you know, as much as we may find it amusing or interesting that they have the father, the son, and then it passes on like a royal family, we had George Bush, then we had another George Bush, and now they're talking about Jeb Bush being the next president. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you look at that, you almost feel how far are we from a feudal uh, un how the democratic Adams. is it? The Adams, you know, yeah. we had the... <laughs> I mean, it's been... You know, this is the finger pointing, though. You know, I think we have to look to our own. Well, country. I guess what what choice do we have? The Ukrainian people had a wonderful election. I'm Ukrainian. <laughs> Are you really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I so was I, very proud, actually. Okay. I was so. very proud. Um, you know, I'm not. Uh, many Ukrainians come to this country and they remain, you know, old school or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, my family was very modern, and I was actually. This was such a, a proud moment. Because, you know, I wonder even in this country, if we're not satisfied, um, if we're worried about whether people really, their vote really did count, why we aren't out in the streets. Exactly. You know, in, in, the, yeah. in those kind of numbers, in peaceful, you know, just the ordinary, uh, you know, citizens. Just but I think in this kind of, what, what I think Iraq and all these situations have made many Americans see is how little choice we do have. And now the whole country is grappling over if we even have a choice in terms of if our spouse says to us, don't keep me alive if I'm a vegetable, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the court is going to yeah, come yeah. in to our hospital room, and perhaps it won't be long till the court comes into our bedroom, you know, I mean, and tells us comes back when to do it and how to do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> they had those rules. I mean, you yeah, know. they do. Though. Some, yeah. some states still have them on the books. In Virginia, so. you know, that was the whole thing. I love Virginia, you know, or Virginia's for lovers. And it was a joke because they have these rules of what you can and cannot do in the bedroom. I mean, yeah. But it's scary because I, I never really looked at it that carefully. And now as I look at it, I see that we're not so far apart. You know, our democracy is what, 200 years old, if mm -hmm. maybe a little more. more than, yeah. Not very old. And a lot of these civilizations, as primitive as some of us may think they are, these people have been around a long time <laughs> yes. dealing with these issues. Yeah. So, um, I, well, I don't and know. specifically with democracy, I mean, even even uh, last January, you know, Muqtadar al Sadr in Najaf called a meeting of Sunni clerics and Shia clerics, and he sat them down, um, and uh, they came up with they want democracy. I mean, they came up with who, who what qualifications the candidates should have. I mean, they just didn't think the American or the coalition forces or the interim government was moving along mm -hmm. fast enough for for their needs. I mean, you need the town supervisor, you need the mayor, you need you need a, a security system, and they were frustrated by that. The only thing, you know, though, mm -hmm. with, with these clerics that he called together, there were none of us in the room. Yeah, yeah. But the, the idea of democracy is there. Now they just have to expand the view to have it. In, you can't have a democracy unless you include women, yeah. everyone well, in the pro equally in the process. I hope everybody out there has really uh, learned something because your experience is amazing, really. And so are your photographs. Thanks so much for joining me. I wish we Thanks for having the courage to actually to have me on. <laughs> you know, hey, I, I take on the lawyers and judges, you know, journalists, a fellow journalists. That's not a problem. Thanks again. You're very welcome. Good luck. Thank you. Oh. My next guest is Del Seligman, who is an attorney in both Manhattan and Kingston, New York. And I am pleased to welcome her back to my show because she has been on before. Thank you, Jen. Really. Um, recently, you were telling me that you were up in Albany uh, testifying or giving information to a committee on 
the custody and divorce situation, the court situation. Could you tell me a little more about that? Uh, we only spoke briefly. Okay, about it. Uh, that's the uh, was the uh, matrimonial commission, and um, uh, Judge uh, Judith uh, the uh, from the uh, Court of Appeals. Judith K. Is that Judith, Judith K. K. From the um, Court of Appeals had uh, started this commission, and it's composed of I think there's about 30 people that are on that commission, and it's composed of uh, lawyers and uh, and judges, uh, and what they're doing is they're uh, trying to see whether they can find ways to improve the uh, matrimonial um, uh, the matrimonial courts, like the divorce and, process, uh, uh, the divorce the whole process, thing. yes. And so um, people uh, who want to speak before that commission uh, contact the commission and tell them that they, what they're going to say, and then you get called there. Now, I, I spoke on November 4th, and uh, I spoke in the afternoon, and I, I have the, actually the transcripts are on um, the internet. So what, how could people access that if they were Well, interested? if you wanted could to they? access it, uh, you go to the, uh, I think it's, uh, it's New York Courts and uh, Matrimonial Commission. Actually, I think if you just put in Matrimonial Commission, you'll get it. You'll get it. New York, New York Matrimonial Commission, and it'll come out. And, um, and then you can read the transcripts of all the uh, Do you think, I, I guess my frustration with, I think Judith Kay has, do, has done a wonderful job to the extent she's done it. Her, her heart seems to be in the right place. Absolutely. But I keep wondering if anything is going to come out of all this. In other words, I remember testifying before some committee that was doing some preliminary work on this, uh, in this area, uh, in Kingston, in Ulster County. So I guess uh, what my question is, is do you think that there will be changes in these antiquated laws. What has to happen in this process? They've, they've interviewed people like you, they've interviewed... How long well, is it going to take? Every, every day I get calls from citizens of the Hudson Valley tearing their hair out because they, men and women, uh, mm. are with the unfair divorce laws and, and the, the kinds of things they're being forced to endure, uh, you know. Well, the whole system, I mean, what I spoke about was that the whole system has to be changed. I, I'm proposing that there be a uh, family agency where instead of going to court, the uh, people want to get divorced, they have to go to an agency. And this agency is composed of, uh, of a panel of people that they, people that the litigants, no longer litigants, but family members will go to this commission, uh, to, the, um, to the agency, and they will be able to talk on a one-to-one -one basis. I mean, the way the court system is set up, I mean, the court system is set up, the matrimonial court system is set up, so it's, you go there as a criminal. That's really what it's about. And, and it shouldn't be that way. I mean, people who want to get divorced are not criminals, but yet they're treated like criminals. Right. The lawyers right. treat them like criminals, and sometimes the judges treat them like criminals also. I mean, and, and they're bound by the rules of evidence. I mean, what do the rules of evidence have to do with the situation? Why shouldn't everything come out? Why shouldn't a litigant be able to talk one-on-one -on -one to the judge and if, if the judge were, the, uh, you know, part of the agency? But if we have... Um, psychologists, if we have psychiatrists, if we have social workers, and we have lawyers, and they're all part of the panel. But the husband goes there, and the wife goes there, the children go there, and they, they have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with these people. And then this panel makes decisions together, not just one person, not just a judge who sees things a different way. Now, do you think that this could happen because the divorce machinery is about money. It's money. about, I'm sorry to say, but yeah. it's about your profession right. making $200 an hour, which is a lot more than most of the people employing your people to defend them and to be their lawyer make. It, people mm -hmm. are in terrible, it becomes a huge financial burden to get a divorce. It is. In New York State, which is supposedly a progressive state, I would love to see Elliot Spitzer, when he becomes governor, Mm -hmm. get his little hand into this mess because that's what we need. We need someone to go in there and just clean it, it up. Has to be it is up. disgusting. Yeah. Now, just so all of you out there know, uh, Dell was supposed to be here with, an, with a litigant from the Hudson Valley who was married 
to a very, very powerful attorney, correct? And she told us her story and wanted to come on this show and tell it. And she was terrified. Uh, her, her husband has put a lien on her bankruptcy. I mean, she's got nothing left to lose, but I don't know what more she can lose, but she was afraid to tell the story. She's just finishing up her trial. Um, she is going to come on and yeah. tell the, her story, which is quite amazing. Yeah. But when you're married to a lawyer, to an attorney, and he's a very powerful person in the county, uh, he knows all the judges, and she tried to get a change of venue and was denied. She appealed it, was denied. Of course, mm -hmm. they want to keep, they want to protect one of their own. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is this whole inbred machinery is a very, very difficult thing to break down and start yeah. again. So I'm wondering, how would you implement a new system? How would it be done by court <laughs> or, I mean, I the judges and lawyers don't want to cut off their... It probably has to be a revolution. I mean, yeah, that, I don't that's know. right. I, don't don't. See, I, I cannot see how it's going to be. I mean, I, I have to say, when I spoke at the, um, uh, to the uh, matrimonial commission, um, when I was finished speaking, every, I, was, I was so amazed. Everyone in the, so many people in the, uh, in the audience jumped up and were clapping because they were hearing from me what they've been saying, you know, over that. Do you they mean these lawy lawyers were applauding no, what you were saying? No, it wasn't the lawyers. lawyers. It, was the, it was the people in the audience that, that I guess, they're, they're litigants or they've been litigants in the past. And, uh, but they're always, they're the ones that are always railing against the lawyers and the, the, the system. And uh, I guess they couldn't believe that somebody that was a lawyer was talking would, would against... Would want to cut off the gravy train, exactly, in effect. Exactly. And, and that's and, the problem. And what I said was, when I first uh, stood up, because people that were talking before me were talking about all the problems that they were having. So I got up and I said, um, uh, you know, I'm going to solve all the problems. I said, unfortunately, if I solve all the problems, everyone in the commission is going to be out of a job. Because then that's really basically what it's all about. And I, and I, I understood that the, that I, I wasn't really looking at them when I was speaking, but I understood that they were like shaking their heads because they're thinking, you know, what is this the lady? She's crazy. She, you know, she wants to put us out of, she wants to put the whole uh, legal system and the matrimonial system out of, out of business. But I, I think that that's the only way. And I cannot see, um, I mean, I, I plan to, uh, to do some lobbying, but I mean, it's it's going to be a hard job. But it's it's it has to be it it has to be a total break. It can't be you can't. It's like building on quicksand. You can't just change law here or there. Mm -hmm. It has to be the whole thing has to be changed. It's got to be a radical change. I think and you're right. I, yeah. I after six years of interviewing people, yeah. judges, lawyers, litigants, I think you're. I I never thought I'd ever say that. I always say, well, you can repair this, and the whole system's not you know, sick and, and, yeah. and infiltrated with, with absolute ridiculousness, but it is. The yeah. truth is this particular thing is because you are trying to legislate human emotion. And there, true, there's a lot of money involved, mm -hmm. but a lot of the, it is not rational thinking it's that's not. going on and dividing up the assets. It's no, got nothing to do with that. It, and it's not that is, but the worst thing I think is the is the custody situations because people get so involved with it. And uh, I've had, well, I'm involved back with a situation that uh, was over in, 19, in, in 2001. Uh, the father got custody, and this was in Westchester. And this case is back again now. In that one, because custody, just so all of you yeah. out there who are who are married or yeah. not married or who don't know, custody is an ever-changing situation. You can all keep going back, unlike a divorce decree, which is yes. final. Yes. Custody is ever-shifting. That that's true, but they ju the uh, the courts uh, and and the cases do say that uh, children are not a bouncing ball and that you shouldn't change custody willy-nilly. I mean, there should be a drastic change in circumstances. If once the court awards custody to one parent, it shouldn't be that the next month another, the, the other parent goes back and tries to get custody. Well, there should be joint custody in every state in the union. It should be a presumption of joint custody. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. Both people should have equal yeah. rights. Yeah. That's the problem. That's because, the problem. because if it were a joint custody state, mm. None of the, half these legal battles wouldn't exist. 
So you could mm. put the lawyers out of business 50% of the time, which yeah. would be good enough for me because, yeah. again, it would benefit the kids. There'd be less psychological stuff going on with these, yeah. uh, the whole social service machinery. Part of the problem is that there is no presumption of joint custody. And that's what John Hurd was in here railing about. And I had a congressman from Long Island, Sidigman, who yeah. sponsored a bill for joint custody. It's called shared parenting. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, it's not, joint, just joint custody. It has to have something more than joint custody because joint custody could be just a word and, and, and name only. Because no residential decision making. It, however, you yeah, want to divide it, has it to up. Be, but there has to be a, a, a more equal sharing of the custody rather than because if if you say joint custody and then you have a primary caretaker, a, a primary custodial parent, and then uh, the child is with that parent most of the time, it still it's not any really different than sole custody. So it has to be more than that. I'm saying both, the presumption should be yeah. that both their two parents yes. share the children, share equally. Yeah. If you want to go into court and, and change that, that's okay. Part of the problem w with a lot of the men that I had on was that it was presumed, and I've heard judges say this, that yeah. the woman innately has has rights to custody above and beyond the man, which shouldn't be you know true what? in this day and age. <laughs> I'm I, not sure that I agree with that. Well, I'm I think you know what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, there's a new generation of people. It's like the old judges, these old white men that are dying out. Yeah. That whole notion of unequal uh, stuff is going to go by the wayside. And I think that a lot of people who grew up in the 50s, I threw it off in the 60s. There are a lot of people who still really believe what they were programmed with. I have seen on my show and I've seen out there in the world, men are very capable parents and I've seen uh, oh, and they should no, not. There's no question about that, but what happens often, I'm going to say often, that the, the, if the father wants to give the mother a hard time, what they do is they say, well, I want custody. So sometimes what happens is that the mother just gives in because she said, I mean, the kids, are, they'll say the kids are the most important thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I don't care if you have to take this, you can take that, give me the kids. And then they're up the creek. You know? But that's what so I'm that's saying. What, so there shouldn't be any fighting about that. Right. That's why I say to, get to rid of the away. damn uh, court system altogether and give us a family agency where we don't have these battles because they're, and people wouldn't be programmed to expect to fight. What the, why are people fighting over the custody of their kids? He, uh, there's this situation where we have this ch woman who uh, she uh, lost custody. She actually, if you could believe this in this day and age, she was accused of witchcraft. If you believe that, <laughs> I that's believe how. It. That's how <laughs> they got the custody away from my client. Who is the judge? I just want to know the judge who believed that this woman practiced witchcraft, because that's no. She, the judge, did not believe that. Well, then the why judge did... didn't believe that the judge was okay. That in in this particular situation, what happened is. But if you were a judge, what he should have done was he should have given a hearing, which he didn't do. And then I filed a notice of appeal on that, but we never went forward with that because by the time that would have been heard, we would have, we were going for the trial already. So. But the first judge that transferred custody, basically, did he have a choice? I mean, would you take the chance if you were the judge and 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 a client? I mean, uh, the mother was accused of witchcraft, and they were talking about worms. They, this father, it never lived in a house in his life. I don't think. I mean, he always lived in an apartment. So they. They had this new house and in Scarsdale. I guess they never had any building had ever been there before. And maybe some worms came in through the fireplace or something like that. He accused her of putting the worms there. And okay, the but did the judge what? bring that up as a valid point in awarding custody? That's what I want to know. Those are the people yes. who should be off the yes. bench. Yes, but the thing is, I, that how could you say the judge was okay? Because the ju the judge didn't. What was the judge to do? He had to make a choice of something. He, ha he could. It, it was like it brain. was like an emergency. Wait, it was like he could an emergency. use his brain, Dell, and say, yeah. "This is ridiculous. I'm not going to entertain these kind of lies in my courtroom." And I have asked Ralph Beisner, who sat in that seat, the reti recently retired Dutchess County Supreme Court judge, because I was accused of absurd things, and I, almost as ridiculous as that, yeah. and I said to Ralph, do you believe all the nonsense that comes across your desk from the, what I call the moneyed spouse, 
who has the exactly. money to spend $200 uh -huh. an hour filing papers. What are you talking about? Cost me thousands. They're, 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 In Scarsdale, it's 500 an hour, uh, right? You know, of course. Okay, I mean, but so the point is when I got divorced, it was 200 an hour. In Ulster County, now it's even more. The yeah. thing that I guess I am trying to get the names of these judges and, and reveal, like, like I said about Mary Work, in yeah, my case. See, I think it's important that people know the names of the judges see, but the who, problem, uh, who, are, who are believing this nonsense. Wait, but the problem is that this particular judge, I had a lot of respect for this judge, notwithstanding. How could you? I, I, worms? He believes that worms are coming in and he's going to use that as a reason not to give custody to a woman? That guy, is, in my book, I don't care what else he's done, great. He should be off the bench. That's the kind of toxic stuff that's going down, and okay. that's why I'm doing this TV show. Okay. That's but, why but I'm this, here. But I this, don't mean to berate you, but Dell, yeah. I mean, really. Well, this judge was <coughs> going off the bench at that time, or at least he was getting out of the matrimonial part of the, of the, uh, the court. And so he made this decision. It was a rapid decision. He's making $135,000 a year. He's retiring with full benefits. He's, I don't feel sorry for this guy. Uh, it's not a question of feeling sorry for him, but I think that what happened is that the forensic evaluator felt that the father should have custody. The law guardian felt that the father should have custody. And why? Because at that time, this guy was... Uh, I mean, he, they were living in a mansion in, in Scarsdale. He was earning $650,000 a year. Uh, he gave the appearance of... Uh, uh, of a debonair, I mean, what I called him, I, I, this is a terrible thing. You're telling I, me because he had money, he was oh, a absolutely. Parent? That's what I they thought. You, okay. That's what that's, they thought. Well, that's what, okay, I mean, you know what? Take me back to Iraq. Because, you know, the women in Iraq have a better deal. Because, you know what? No one in Iraq is going to say, take a kid you know, to they live in a mansion. <laughs> the guy's got a lot of money. He's debonair. He, he thinks his wife is a witch. Hey, he must be a great guy. I'll bet you anything those kids will be in psychotherapy for the rest of oh, their God. lives. Well, you, with a decision like that, well, this is what's wrong with America. Well, That's the kind of stuff. And that judge who's sitting in that seat in Westchester, I'd like, you to, I'd like to know his name. I'd like to invite him to sit right there and tell me how he gave custody to some rich guy well, because he, he had money. Because that says nothing about what kind of father he is. What did this man, who is this man? Besides having money, well, he, th but this is the whole thing. <laughs> this was it was a different. This judge. is like you but know. This is it's, it's it's very weird. But the the judge. Weird. I think it's pathetic. All right, but the judge who took the the first changed custody from the mother to the father in the middle. I mean, before there was any hearing, before there was anything, is a different judge who the ju from the judge that we had at the hearing. Now, we had a custody hearing. He was a different judge. The judge at the hearing was completely and totally prejudiced against my client from the very beginning. Why? Because he was buddy-buddy with the lawyer for the, uh, for the father, and he was buddy-buddy with the law guardian. And the law guardian was so impressed with this guy, uh, with the father, and, and, and the thing, he made a, a report within 27 days Normally, I mean, now the law guardians are not even allowed to make reports. They're not able to make a written report. But in 27 days, he made a decision, and, and, he, he, and he got that uh, report to the judge as quickly as he possibly could that the father should have custody. But the, but the judge kept the custody with the mother anyway. It wasn't until he got these affidavits about this witchcraft business that the judge decided that, hey, there may be more something here than, than, than meets the eye. So Who was this judge? I'm not, I, I, can't, I'm, I can't. I will I, find I, out, I and I will tell everybody out there who this judge is. Because it's important but th to this, know. But this judge was not the, the worst. The, the, the judge at the hearing was the real bad judge. I mean, I've actually... But do you realize, wait, you have just given me an example of everything that is wrong with the system. Well, and, and I am actually agree 100% with you, tear the whole thing down. Okay, because if one person... Yeah. Children were taken away from them because of 
based on the most ridiculous, ridiculous. things. Ridiculous. And these people went to law school, and these were the judge. This judge was appointed in Westchester yeah. or elected. Yeah. Every one of his constituents, yeah. and my show runs in Westchester, should know who this guy is. Okay, and that is an outrage. Jo Joanne, the, yeah. but the, I, the I worst of it, the worst <laughs> of it was when the when the uh, the decision of the why. The, well, first of all, we had a very long trial. It was many, 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 many. How much days. did it cost? Well. Uh, the, it's all, all fully documented because the, this, this father, after he got custody of the daughter, who he never took care of and never took care of before or never took care of after, because he, he always had a housekeeper that was going to take care of this child, you know. Because he's but, such a wonderful father. Yeah, he spent so much time. Never spent a Because he, didn't, he spent no time. He, he hired a housekeeper. Spent, he never spent a day now with her. Now, that is okay. what the judge's values were that makes a good parent, right? He didn't parent, want to right? hear about that. Okay. He didn't want to hear about that. I got to tell All you, he was is, interested this in. This is so crazy. Wait a minute. This is the worst. <laughs> All the judge was interested in was that this guy, and at the time, mind you, this guy was not, he wasn't working because he had left his job, and, uh, but he was going to develop uh, a software program that was going to allow rapid trades. And, it was a, and, and he, he, he didn't have a bank account. He didn't have anything that he had formed a corporation, big deal, you know, you spend a hundred dollars, you form a corporation. He had no background, he had no uh, clients, he had no accounts, he had nothing. All he had was this idea. So the judge said, oh, this guy is going to be so prosperous. And, and when he weighed as to which of the two... The, uh, what did the uh, mother do for a living? That well, was she so was terrible. A, she was okay, she was doing... No, she was... She was they, she was doing very well. She was uh, a programmer, and she was working. And uh, she, but her job was, I mean, you know, she was earning like forty, fifty thousand dollars. Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me the yardstick for custody is how much money a person That's makes? That's exactly the decision that the judge made. That exactly. is the Hey, you know what? And I, I, I have to tell you, better to be in Iraq. Yes. I swear to you, okay. if money is the yardstick of a good parent, said. you're better to be in the Middle East okay. as a woman. I swear okay. to you. This is what because the judge that, said. He said, this guy has all this potential. His, he is going to be an enormous success. Okay, this was in 2000. What about the parenting? You haven't said he one word about parenting. that. parenting. He said that they were both good parents. He said there was nothing wrong with my client as far as parenting is concerned. She was a wonderful mother. And but he because puts it in the she decision. didn't make as much, how much did she make a year? Probably a hundred thousand. Forty-five of fifty thousand. Okay. And, and you know, and, and, and uh -huh. his last uh, income was six hundred and fifty thousand. But he was making nothing at that particular time. But let me tell you what happened in the five. What's that? Two thousand and one is two thousand and five. Okay, he got custody of the little girl. And once he got custody of the girl, this em 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 emboldened him that he wanted now custody of his two sons from the first wife who lived in Brooklyn. So he now had custody, he figured, I'll go get custody of my two sons. Well, he went into Brooklyn and he stepped into a quagmire in Brooklyn. After three or four years of litigation, he never, he didn't get anywhere. The, they weren't the, impressed with the salary. They weren't impressed with him. And for, but forensic <laughs> evaluator had said about him, by the way, I represented his first wife too, bef not, not during this custody, second custody proceeding, but in the first one. But in any event, uh, he, um, he got nowhere. The, the forensic evaluator decided that he had, uh, he, he was trying to brainwash his kids, that the kids were saying they were like parroting exactly what he was saying exactly. In any event, uh, the, he got nowhere with that and he lost that. Not only that, but he lost uh, time with the kids. The, the judge decided that he should have less time with the children and that uh, he should have no more decision making with the first wife because it was just, uh, it was too much. Now, as it turns out, the guy has not worked since 1999. He sold his house in, uh, in Scarsdale. He moved into an apartment or a townhouse. Now he's moved into a smaller apartment. He's got no more housekeepers. He's got no more job. He's, he's crying. He's broke. He's, uh, he's, but he has custody. He still has custody. And a mother has visitation. Mother once has a visitation. Week, right? Now we're back in court trying to get custody based on what he has said about himself. He said, I'm broke. Uh, uh, he's depressed. He doesn't have any, um, uh, what, what the hell is he he's talking about? His, his mental condition. He's unable to concentrate. And the child, the little girl, is doing very badly in school. She does, she's not failing. <laughs> what you know? a surprise, Dell. Yeah. <laughs>
But she was taken is, away from her mother. She was taken away from her mother, and now she and who's taking care of her now? The father's eighty-year-old mother. The eighty-year-old mother has to take, cook, clean, and take this kid, get this kid to school. And the father has lost his ability to drive because he owes so much child support to the first wife that they took his license away. You know what? I, Lorna, I don't know how many of you out there saw the first half of my show tonight, but Lorna Tykostep, who was in Iraq four times, brought photographs of poverty-struck people, probably, by our standards. Yeah. You know what's so sad to me? Hmm. They have a richer existence. These people are kings compared to what you just described. Uh, this, this, what this, you just this, described to me, if this kid doesn't, if she doesn't need a psychiatrist for the rest of her life after being through this system and that parent and that judge's decisions, and I'm sure he sleeps at night, that is criminal. And that is why, I mean, what you just said is, is what you, the story you just told, Fun in Scarsdale in court, you know, the wonderful community of Scarsdale where everybody has a lot of money and goes to the best schools and all that. This is the, the toxic nature this of the a, courts and this, yeah. and you are absolutely right. You are right. We should tear down the whole system. To but I got to say, every time we go marching into another country that's so-called underdeveloped, mm -hmm. we ought to take a look at what's going on in Scarsdale's of America. Yeah. Because what you just took, what you just told, is absolutely harrowing. Our, our society is even sicker than anything. You have, what you have just told me is the sickest thing I have heard in, in, in years. And that includes Iraq, Iran, and all those countries over there that we're going to bring democracy to. And if anybody out there has any you know, question about that, I mean, think about what's going on in your own backyard. We ought to be sending Army and National Guard to Scarsdale. <laughs> so anyway, that's all oh, I have God. to say. I, I mean, hope I'm, I'm I, laughing, you know. but you know it's not. I mean, people. My client is is living this. I mean, can you imagine? No, I can't. I mean, you can imagine can't. how she's and paying you this. and the judge is earning one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars in New York State, right? Supreme Court, retiring with full benefits, playing golf on the weekends with all the lawyers. I, you know, something's not exactly not right. right. I mean, I, I'm outraged by it. I, I don't know how you. You can know, do and, and it. you were talking about that the other uh, lady that that didn't come on the show. That, yes, uh, who was know. married to an attorney. Okay, I mean, but you know, I always say, I've heard it all. Then I hear something, and when I saw the papers that she brought at one, when I they were like three, what six inches I couldn't believe thick? it. She was she yeah. was pro se, and they slammed pro her. Pro se means she had no lawyer. She had no lawyer, and they they slammed her with these papers, and um, it just was beyond belief. Her story was I don't know if it was as wor worse than this story, but it was pretty bad. Her Again, story. it has nothing to do with men, women. It it's just it, it it's the person. <sighs> who gets the wrong judge, I mean, the wrong uh, attorney, perhaps, and, and very often just gets the bad, the bad luck of, of, of having a spouse who's so angry that they will stop at nothing. And God forbid that person has an unlimited bank account, you know. Yeah. But anyway, listen, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry we have to wrap up this show, really? but I um, thank you very much, Del, for yeah. coming. <laughs> Telling this fable. I wish it were. A f I wish it were a fable. I wish it and it were a fable. True. I wish it were. <laughs> but everything Dell has said about tearing down that system is epitomized by that story. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I hope all of you out there think about um, both these women and and what they said tonight, because I certainly will. Thank you for joining me, and good night. <laughs>